Hi, thank you, John. Hi, well, thank you for choosing me and not the World Cup. That's very nice of you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I recognise any names. I know that you're all textiles teachers. Um, so I'm going to do a presentation first of all, a PowerPoint presentation about my work and the things that influenced me. And I'm going to share some techniques with you. And then I'm going to do a short demo at the end. So I know you're all on mute at the moment, but if you want to ask me anything along the way, please do. If you want to just to ask a general question or you want me to explain something in more detail, I'm quite happy to do that. OK, um, I actually used to teach art. Uh, I retired in 2016. I taught art and design and I'm a self-taught textile artist. I started working with fabrics in about 2005. So I'm going to go into a screen show, as I say, if you have any uh, questions, then um, please do ask me about uh, anything that you want to have clarified. Okay, so let me just start this slideshow. Come on, from the beginning. Okay. Let me just see if I can move that down. Okay, so um, the first technique I wanted to talk to you about is a, a fused fabric technique. So I'm sure that you all know this technique, but I'm, I'll just explain it to you anyway, in case you're not too familiar with it. So I'm going to also, as I say, talk about some influences. And this particular piece is, is based on the Garden of Eden. And for this, I've created a piece of fused fabric as the base for the piece of work. So to do that, you take a piece of felt. On top of that, you scatter pieces of organza, um, transparent material, chiffons. And then on top of that, you put a layer of netting and then you take a soldering iron and you score through all of the layers of fabric and the, solder, the soldering will create a, a piece that's actually fused together. Literally all the pieces are fixed together. And then you sew that over and over again. And you can use that to make either a background for something or you can use it to make an object such as, um, as in this instance, a flying fish or a, a peacock. So this one, you can see the fused fabric has been used here in the background and it's been stitched and stitched and you can see here the netting on the top. The flowers have also been made using the fused fabric technique. As I say, the fish has and also the peacock, which is here. Another material I use an awful lot, and I don't know whether you've used this in your practice, but it's something called funky foam. It's actually called neoprene foam. That's the grown up name for it but it comes in A4 sheets and you can buy it from places like Tesco or Hobbycraft. And I find it extremely useful for doing things like detail. So in this particular piece, I've used the foam to cut out small leaf shapes, which I've then incised with a biro. And then I've added more biro and acrylic paint to create the leaves uh, for these uh, apple trees. I've also used it on the leaves here. But you can, as I say, you can cut it, you can incise it, you can stitch it and you can paint it and you can tr transform it into all sorts of different materials. The figures here, I've drawn those onto paper. Uh, this is an older piece, it's perhaps about 10 years old plus. And what I've done with the drawing is photocopied it onto acetate, then I've stitched it onto the background and then I've painted it with acrylic. And I do use acrylic quite extensively in my work. So just because something has got fabric on it, um, it doesn't mean it can't be painted. So quite often I will add acrylic to um, highlight certain areas. And the little frog has been made by wrapping some wadding round and round with some embroidery thread. And the arms and the legs are made from pipe cleaners, which again have been wrapped around and the, the, the feet are made from funky foam. So this is another one, I think. Let me have a look. What's the next one? Um, just trying to clip down just a second. Seems to want to freeze for some reason. Uh, so just give me a second. It doesn't, it's not wanting to scroll. Oh, here we are. Sorry. Right. Oh, sorry. I just need to move it. Right. OK, so this is also done with fused fabric. The, the previous piece was about perhaps about eight inches by 12 inches. This is a larger piece, which is a one in size. And I do quite like to look at different influences like art history or history or religion or mythology or symbolism. And for this one, I've looked at some paintings by Botticelli. And this one, as I say, is just a bit bigger than a one size. And the background again has been created using this fused fabric technique. You can see the leaves have also been created using this technique. 
and I've, again use funky foam to create all the little leaves so they're tiny little leaves that have been cut out and then painted um, and glued on and the tree trunks have been made with pipe cleaners which have been wrapped round and round to create these tree trunks I do use recycle things and upcycle things and I, I do buy materials from strange places so I think this particular one there's some tubing from B&Q to create the branches here and the oranges have been made using a, a very large string of beads from Christmas. Again, the same technique of, of drawing onto uh, paper and then photocopying onto acetate for the figures here. And more fused fabric for the flowers here and the peacock. So it's a great technique. If you want to create something for your students, what you could do is, uh, and this is a workshop that I offer, each student makes a piece of fused fabric, an A4 piece, and then would take um, a template of something like a fish, for example, or a frog or a seahorse, and then free machine stitch the template onto the back of the fused fabric. So when you turn the fabric over to the front, you'll get the outline of your template showing through. And I can show you some examples of that in a second, well, but after the presentation. The other thing that I'm doing a lot at the moment, and this is what the demo is going to be, is something that I'm going to explain to you now, which involves using plastic. So this particular project went into an Embroiderers Guild magazine um, edition uh, about a year and a half ago, and it was based on Victorian imagery, Victorian uh, jewellery and Victorian scraps, which you probably know Victorians used to collect and they used to put them on screens and make scrapbooks out of them. And they're, they're always very kind of sentimental things. Um, and in this instance, I've chosen this rather beautiful bird. So on the left, what you're seeing there is a drawing on A3 based on a Victorian brooch. And I've added the bird and some flowers onto there. On the right hand side, you'll see there's a piece of PVC. So this is crystal clear PVC plastic, which initially I bought from the internet, but subsequently I found my local a fabric shop can supply for me. It's a little bit similar to using the acetate, which previously I've shown you as a photocopied element. But with this one, what you do is you take a piece of PVC, place it over your image, and then not with a biro as in this instance, but with a Sharpie I found is the best material to use. With a Sharpie, you trace the outline of your object um, and, and just put, put all the detail on that you're going to need to stitch. And then what you do after that, and this is the kind of a few stages in advance, what you're seeing there top left is on the, the bottom layer, it's a layered piece. The bottom layer is a piece of PVC plastic, which is clear. On top of that, I'll put some iridescent cellophane. So what you're seeing there is some sort of greeny blue cellophane and also some pinky green cellophane. And then on top of that, you put your traced layer. So you've got a sandwich. So it's very much layering like the fused fabric, but in this instance, it's plastics. Then you pin all of those elements together and then you machine stitch, you free machine stitch. So you can see on this one, what I've done is done the outlines with a darker colour. And then I've started to thread paint, if you like, or free machine stitch the detail. So on here, you can see the finished piece um, or the finished bird. The photograph doesn't show you very clearly, but the body is actually padded and the wings come forward. So it's very much um, uh, produced in relief. And you can see bottom left, I've used funky foam again, and you, you're seeing its versatility now. You can see the flowers are quite large compared to the paintbrush. So they've been cut out of foam and then incised along the, ed along the, the length of the petals with a pair of scissors to create channels. And then I've used acrylic paint on top of that to give it some uh, variety of colour. And on top of those, I've added a little bit of gold leaf. And I've created the centre by taking some paper clips and pushing those through. And again, you can see the leaves here have been made using the, uh, the foam. So I made two final pieces for this particular um, project. I love bright colour, so I used um, my favourite combination of orange and blue for this. So you can see on the left hand side, the brooch element has been made using funky foam again, which has got some gold leaf on it. And then the background 
is kind of lace, layered lace, and that's been padded. So the whole piece, again, is almost like a kind of cushion effect. And you can see the bird is fitted into the middle. The, the, the secret when you're assembling these is not to stick them down completely flat. So what I've done is put hot glue behind the center of each flower. And then around the petals here, around the edges, I've put some more glue. And then when the glue has been drying, I've just pushed the petals in so that they create a kind of archway as they dry. And it gives you a far more organic effect. And you can also see on the left hand side, on the right hand side, how very different it looks in a different colourway. So this is for people who perhaps like something a little bit more subtle. And I think you can probably see on this one um, the kind of um, the, the three dimensional element a little bit more clearly. It's also the technique I've used for the next one. So this one was in a publication called Maggie Gray's Wow Book 6. And it's exactly the same technique. I did a drawing of the tulips, first of all, on A3 paper and then traced it as before and then did the layering. So inside there, you're seeing some iridescent wrapping paper, actually. Um, there's also some paper, some, some plastic, I think it was some party bags, which had dots on. So essentially, you can put anything inside these, uh, these layers as long as you can stitch through it. It's, it's interesting if you make the inserts transparent. So what happens is you, you stitch it. So I've done the edges, um, I've filled in the, the petals, and I've added these two butterflies. Because it's transparent, you can display it in different ways and it's a very versatile medium to use. So in this instance, you can hang it up against a white wall using the blue tabs. You can hang it against a window and it looks exactly like a stained glass window. And on the left hand side there, you can see what I've done is I've curved it into a cylinder shape and then I've put into that a plastic bottle. And then you can use it to display flowers or whatever, or even possibly a nightlight in there. Um, and what I've also done is put added some lights, some LED lights. So again, it's that extra kind of element that whenever you do this, whenever you show students or you know when you show an audience a piece and you, you switch the lights on, everybody gets quite excited about it. So it's just an extra element that you can add to make it more interesting. So the plastics came about because of a, a couple of pieces I made in 2019. And this is another influence. This is the natural world. And this was in response to the theme of fragility. And for this, I looked at uh, the natural world and looked at the Great Barrier Reef and the damage being caused by pollution, by global warming, even sun cream, just by just rubbish, really, that, that, that is um, ruining the ocean. So the idea was that, uh, uh, as you gather by the name, the top part is very much faded, it's ragged, the colours are quite subdued. And then as you go further down into the reef, the colours become far more vibrant um, as they should be. This, both pieces are five feet in height. Um, I think the one on the right is three feet, three and a half feet in, in width. Uh, the other one slightly narrow, perhaps two, two and a half feet. These have all been drawn on calico. So each individual fish or seahorse, whatever, has been physically drawn on calico and then painted and then also has been free machine stitched. The one on the left is the first piece I actually started to put plastics in. And I don't think you can see on this particular image especially well, but the one on the left hand side actually included little pieces of plastic uh, around the base here. And having done that, I decided that I really was interested in this idea of using the plastics. So I um, remade the piece entirely out of plastics this time. I don't know if is this in the way up here. Shall I try to move that out of the way? Um, so at the very bottom here, there's a little lobster. You can see the lobster. And that's actually stuffed with uh, bubble wrap. So the entire thing is plastics. Um, it's quite a useful material to use as well. If you want them to do something a little bit uh, touching on recycling, then you can include all sorts of elements like yogurt pots and um, cartons that you've cut up um, and you can introduce that kind of awareness of the environment into a project. So I thought that the barrier reef was an ideal one to kind of showcase that, that particular um, element. So these are close-ups from the left-hand piece. So you can see here, I've included all sorts of things. There's some foam here, some funky foam in a gray color. 
I've upcycled or reused things like garlic netting, or fruit netting. There are some old bits of scrim here, there's old bits of lace, all sorts of, of, of scraps really. And on here you can see, this is the first time I started to use the plastic. This is actually some acetate, which has been cut into a kind of rosette shape um, and then um, added on. And this is the lower portion. Again, lots of hand stitching and free machine embroidery. Um, I draw the, the pieces on calico first, then I put some basic color down. Then I take some very thick interfacing and I pin the drawn element onto the interfacing. And then you can free machine stitch that without having to use a hoop. So that's quite a good tip if you wanted to do some sewing but you don't want to have that hindrance of having a hoop within which you've got to stitch. And again, down here, you can see some little plastic rosettes. Whoops, hang on a second. So this one is a, a, a different um, aspect again. This is looking at different cultures. Uh, as I said to you before, that's something that I'm very interested in. And this piece was produced for an exhibition which was held in Macclesfield in 2017. And the exhibition was looking at India and the influence of India on William Morris and also looking at uh, the, the town of Leek, which is just south of Macclesfield, which was very famous for um, a dyeing factory, which was run by um, somebody whose name I can't remember. I'll remember in a second. Um, but the exhibition was looking at the, um, the collaboration between William Morris and the person who did the dyeing, whose name I can't remember. Um, and they worked together to produce a method of, of making silk very uh, light fast and uh, making the colours retain their strength. So the exhibition had my work in it and some William Morris work. So I can say I've had a joint exhibition with William Morris, which is quite, quite nice. But this piece was called the Silk Peacock. And the idea was that each of the feathers of the peacock would have some kind of Indian element or element based on William Morris. Um, I'm really sorry, I can't remember the name of, the, of the, the person. It will come back to me as soon as I finish speaking, I'm sure. But again, this is um, an example of using different materials as well. So each of the 25 feathers on, of, of the peacock have got these feathered elements. And this was using some leftover kitchen lino. And the concept of this, it's very tall. It's, um, Thomas Wardle is the name of the dyer, sorry, Thomas Wardle. So um, the concept for this was to make a piece which started against the wall and then fell out like a crinoline dress. So, you know, I had this idea of how I wanted the piece to look. And each of the feathers has got a metal strip running up the length of it with a hook. And that hooks around this uh, metal collar here to create the crinoline idea. Um, I use hoops quite a lot in my work as well. I mean, that's um, something that I'll refer to a bit later on, but um, I find that they're, they're very useful for displaying. So, you know, just sort of hoop that you would get from a pound shop. Um, they can solve your problem of what to frame something with. Um, so I do recommend that you perhaps think about using a circular format. This is the Indian god of love who's called Kamadeva, and he's riding on a parrot with his consort here. And that's the largest piece at the bottom. So again, a little bit of um, inspiration from different cultures and bringing them all together in one piece. In this instance, India and, um, you know, and also on William Morris. Whoops, I'm going too fast. OK, so different influences again now. So the, these are influenced by literature and uh, kind of religion, I suppose. Um, I'm a member of a group of Textile 21, and I know there's a member of the group watching tonight, um, so she will know what I'm talking about. But this is, um, a, I'm going to show you a triptych, which was made for an exhibition at Chester Cathedral. And the exhibition was based on the cathedral's theme, which was journeys. So I've made a piece based, well, it's called the, the, White, the Wild Swan Triptych. And again, as I say, it's, a, it's an example of being influenced by uh, you know, different cultures and, and um, poetry in this instance. So the, this piece you see now is called The Wild Swan, and it's based on a poem by W.B. Yeats, which was written in 1917. Um, and I've taken a, um, a verse from the poem 
to explain this particular piece. It says, but now they drift on the still water, mysterious, beautiful, amongst what rushes will they build? By what lakes edge or pool, delight men's eyes, when I awake someday to find that they have flown away. So it fits in with the journey theme. So you, you, the, I'm creating this idea of this very mysterious, dark still pond with the, with the bird on the top, five feet by five feet, I think I said to you. And the concept is that the bird is there and then the next day it's disappeared, it's flown off, it's migrated, it's on a journey it's just somewhere else. And this is all done with a plastic entrapment. It was quite difficult getting this under the machine, as you can imagine, wrestling with a five foot wide piece of, of, of plastic. The swan is completely painted with acrylic. There's, there's actually no stitching on this one at all. And then the water is actually darkened. This is the colour uh, that isn't quite right. But I made these bulrushes um, and all these little frogs sitting on lily, lily pads. So the concept is that this swan flies out into the next image. I've put this in here for reference. So this is the swan that I found uh, and used um, as the source material. This swan here is the one you'll see in the next image. This one is very much stitched. So you can probably see there are little bits of lace under here. So um, just laid out onto a piece of calico uh, and then stitched as I've mentioned before. And this swan flies off to 12th century Persia in this instance. Um, I, knew, I knew about this poem somewhere in the back of my mind. I remember we were in the car one day and I was thinking, how can I make a piece about this swan and about these birds? And this, this phrase, conference of the birds, sprang into mind. So I looked it up and it's actually written as an epic poem. I've not read all of it, but I've, I've kind of got the praise of it. And the, the story is that a group of 30 birds led by the kind of the chief bird here, which is, is um, a hoopoe, go on a journey, a spiritual quest to find a mythical bird called the Simorg, which is similar to a phoenix. So they, they go through all sorts of trials and tribulations to, to reach this bird. But I really liked the idea of being able to research lots and lots of different birds um, and make a piece which in the end turned out to be eight feet by five feet. It, it was an epic piece of work as well as an epic poem. So I've got some uh, examples of the birds to show you. So that's the hoopoe. That's been done with both plastics and with fabric. And I do like incorporating words as well in work um, and quotations. So this is what the hoopoe says to the birds that come to meet him. He says, join me, and when at last we end our quest, our king will greet you as his honoured guest. So that gives you the context of the poem, that they're, they're off to, to find, you know, to, to, on a quest to reach their goal. And on this side, you can see where the hoopoe has been partly painted onto the calico, um, and there's a partly stitched flamingo here. The parrot was done with the plastic technique, and the kingfisher has been done by just painting directly and then, and then stitching directly onto fabric. Oh, going too fast. So this one, uh, this is the conference of the birds. This is the middle one of the triptych. I've not got it all on, on the page there because it's very difficult to, to photograph. But you can see the simorg here um, at the top. There is a sun and moon at the top uh, as well, which is put on to imply a, a journey through time, through day and through night. You can see the white swan here at the bottom. Um, again, this was really quite difficult technically to do because I discovered that it was quite hard to make plastic stick to plastic. So I, initially I was going to put a completely plastic background on this but discovered that that actually wasn't going to be possible. So I had to use fabric. So I was um, getting printed fabrics and also some um, velvet. Uh, and again, technically quite difficult to put together, but um, you know, I felt it, it, it did come together really well uh, in the end. Uh, what you can't see as well is that there's a, a little word welcome bottom left. And that again is the word that the hoopoe uses to, to greet everybody um, as they're joining in. So from this image, they fly off to actually find this Simorg bird. So this is very different in feel. So this one, I, I had a look at Persian images of this particular bird, and I kind of made a composite of all sorts of different things. So it, 
now rather than the religious but you're looking at a kind of myth mythological aspect if you like so as i say it's like a phoenix so i gave him this very squishy tail and it's a huge bird which lives in the tree of life and it can hold an elephant in its beak and in its claws i wanted it to be very um iridescent very um shiny so i've gone for the opposites of orange and blue i've looked at persian cloud formations as well so these are lovely kind of swirly images here again another sun um and then another stanza from the poem um which says there in the simorg's radiant face they saw themselves the simorg of the world the simorg trusts last flawless jewel what i understand that means is it's based on the sufi religion and I think if I've interpreted it correctly, it means that when the birds actually arrived at their goal, they actually, the word Simorg apparently means 30. So when they reached the Simorg, they have found what they were looking for in themselves, if you like. So it's got this kind of spiritual message. Um, and there, bottom right, is the swan, um, which is on the Simorg image. And he's kind of trudging off to the right. And I've got some ideas, actually, about him going on to some other adventures. So I'm researching swans in other cultures. I've found some quite interesting stained glass windows with swans as well. So it's an example of perhaps using one particular bird or item and looking to see how different cultures might have interpreted it or used it. So you've got Lader and the Swan, you've got Swan Lake. Um, and it's just a slightly different way of, of looking at how to develop a piece of work really. Uh, so there's me uh, standing at Chester Cathedral with the pieces. So you can see probably from there how large they were. Uh, you can see the sun and the moon appear, as I've said, with the owl in front of it here. Um, the colours a bit faded out, but they did. They worked very well on this uh, this very dark background. So um, I just wanted to show you those because of the the sheer scale of it. Uh, I've just got one or two more to show you now. At the moment, um, I'm working on something a little bit different. Again. This is with my textile group, Textile 21. And we're all um, investigating a particular colour. Um, we started this about 18 months ago. And the kind of working title for it is the, the discerning palette. And again, this is a way of using a, a starting point, but going off in all sorts of different directions, but still hanging on to that basic concept. So you're probably surprised to hear that the colour I was allocated was red um, and I looked a little bit at red and found out that it, it was made from cochineal from uh, you know the, the, the Americas um, but then I started to look at the the way the colour red was used in a, in a more symbolic way and I hit upon the idea of the red list now there was a lot of talk about red lists during Covid when the countries were on a red list and all sorts of different things were going on but there, there are red lists that apply to all sorts of other areas of life as well. And this particular red list is looking at endangered species. So there's a red list, there's an amber and there's a green list. And what I'm starting to look at is um, animals that are in danger, critically endangered. So I've, it's been fantastic researching this because it means you can spend a lot of time on the internet looking at different things. So I've, I've found out all sorts of information, um, you know, worldwide things that are you can be influenced by so it's going to be a very large piece i've got this idea in my head that it's going to be huge and the initially the title was the cabinet of curiosities you probably know the victorians used to collect things you know so they would go off on tours and bring things by you know sh shriveled heads and um, fossils and you know fantastic things from other countries and they would display them in the cabinet of curiosities so that's the working title so the idea is that if, if nothing is done to save these animals, then the only place you will see them is in a cabinet. Um, having done a little bit more research later on, I discovered, well, actually only about a week ago, that another name for a cabinet of curiosities is Wonder Room. So I've actually now changed the title to Wonder Room, which I think is a little bit more kind of intriguing than cabinet of curiosities. So the two things you're seeing there, um, I forget, is it a tawny owl? I can't, can't quite remember. But initially, I thought I wanted a kind of Victorian feel to it. So this piece of fabric is actually from a sample book that I got from a local mill. And what I've done is started to stitch over the top to give it a kind of, uh, as I say, Victorian feel. Um, but 
subsequently I've decided I'd rather have something a little bit more modern so I may well change that background and that's the nice thing about it you can actually change things as you go along the chameleon on the left is quite large I'd say that's probably a bit larger than a2 and this one was done using the plastics the owl was done with some plastics and some fabrics but the chameleon is done entirely with plastics so there's a lot of very beautiful blue iridescent um, cellophane in there and it's padded as you can see it's three-dimensional the rainbow this uh, branch that it's on is a um, hose pipe that's been wrapped around and around with the ribbon and for this background because I wanted it to um, fit with a chameleon I found some commercially printed fabric with these leaf patterns on which I then painted and I added some plastic leaves around here so the whole thing when you see it kind of in, in the flesh as it were um, it, it really does you know the, the, the chameleon really does match its background uh, and then there's just a couple more I think um, so again um, these are for the uh, the wonder room so again quite large panels so the one on the left is a black book that's that's flat stitched onto a piece of calico but the leaves here at the front are slightly raised so all of this is machine stitched but I've also added some paint onto there um, and I wanted quite a loose background so I've splashed some brush on there and then put a bit of bleach on to get that faded effect the tiger is really quite long he must be about four feet in height and I've used the same background that I used on the chameleon um, but I did some darker and lighter colours and then this is completely machine stitched and around the head and particularly where the white areas are there's quite a lot of thick acrylic paint so I do use it to add some form to the things I'm making and these on the left hand uh, right hand side these are much smaller these are perhaps about four by six inches and I'm making lots of little panels so the idea is that everything will kind of fit together like a very modern quilt so I've got a pygmy um, hedgehog, um, a little lemur there, and a pygmy uh, hog. Um, sorry, just need to... Okay, and, and these are also for the same piece. So there's a mandarin fish on the left, the right hand side. Now I think in, in reality, apparently these are only about three inches long, but the one I've made is probably about two feet long. And this probably shows you how effective the technique is with the layering of the plastics because you can see I've made the background out of the iridescent plastics here cut some holes in this is actually against a I think I put it on the lawn which is why it's a darker color behind it um but you get a beautiful shimmer effect and here as well the cellophane I've used is a, a lovely kind of greeny blue uh, a greeny pink color so you can really see through to the layers beneath and um I found some lovely sequins as well, which I've stitched on. So, uh, and I've used some fabric here, which I've heat treated. Um, so it shrivels so that it looks a little bit like seaweed, if you like. So I've just put um, this penultimate one. This, these are some things that have been done in workshops. So uh, I think this top one here was done by uh, an art, a textiles teacher. Uh, when I did some work for Dawn, um, just before lockdown now and this was a day-long workshop um, and so each uh, participant had a wire ring which are used for flower arranging and I can show you one of those afterwards they're very good for displaying work um, very inexpensive you can bulk buy they're probably only about 50 pence or, or less than that per per ring but you can see here at the, this low one this was done by an adult on a, a day workshop you can see what they look like uh, before you've actually added any any background to them so I do recommend those as um, you know as, as a possible uh, frame for your work this these are done these were done by uh, your 10 students in a one-day workshop so I think these particular ones are the fused fabric technique so during the workshop they would make an item and then I call the workshop small worlds so they make a make a butterfly fish whatever of their choice from the templates and then they have to make an environment for it to sit in hence the small worlds uh, this was done by an adult in a workshop not that long ago and this one which I think is lovely was done uh, two weeks ago by a 10 student at a school in Abingdon in Oxfordshire um, and this was the plastic entrapment uh, method there uh, it was beautifully stitched actually um, she did a lovely job of matching the colours 
and these leaves are, are a funky foam. So thank you for watching that. Um, I hope that you've got some questions as a result of some of the things I said. So I'm quite, you know, very happy to answer the questions. I'll just stop the share. Um, and then I've got some examples to show you um, in person if you would like to see some. Right, okay. So do, has anybody got any questions they'd like to ask? Well, I have tea. I think there's a couple, a couple of questions on the chat. Oh, um, right, okay. Marion has asked, what type of machine needles are you using when stitching through extra layers and thick fabric? Um, it's either is it a 90-something or, or a jeans needle. But you, you, if you're doing the plastic stitching, you'll find it's very easy to sew through with, with you know, just a... a um, a jeans needle. I don't have much problem with them breaking or anything like that. It's quite they're quite easy to uh, to use. Are there any more questions? I should look to see what's on the chat. I can't, yeah, I can't see any more on the chat actually. I think that was the only. Oh, another one here. Do you need a Teflon foot when sewing the PVC? Um, I've, I just use an ordinary um, free machine foot, so there's no difference. No, I don't think so. You shouldn't you shouldn't find any problem with the PVC. Occasionally people find it difficult to, to move it, but very rarely. It's, it's quite a simple technique. Um, and because the plastic is, is nice and smooth and flat, then you don't have the problem of fabrics kind of catching and that sort of thing. So it's, it's quite easy to use, yeah. Somebody else has said, I have a student wanting to sew through cellophane. Do you have any tips to stop it ripping? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you put it between two sheets of plastic is what you do, um, which is what I'm going to, to show you in, in a few minutes. So, but th this is so you'd have to have something to support it because it's not going to hold its, you know, its form, is it? It needs something to strengthen it. And somebody else says, can you explain what you mean by fused fabric? Okay, so I'll explain it again. Um, I don't think I've got any fused fabric with me, but you take a piece of A4 felt and then you can use um, iridescent fabrics, so things like this. Um, I don't know if I've got much here with me. So just, just little scraps of fabric and you lay those out onto your felt um, and cover the whole thing over. So pieces may be about that size and you, you actually cover the whole piece of fabric over. And then take a piece of netting, you know, the sort that you would have on a, 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 a ballet, ballet tutu. That goes over the whole piece of uh, of the, the the felt and the fabric, and then with the soldering iron, you just score along. So you can use a, a metal ruler and score lines through it, or you can just dab, um, you know, press on quite hard, um, and the soldering iron will literally melt the fabric, and, and it'll adhere to the felt, and then you can stitch it. Okay, is that okay? I think that's it for now. Yeah. Right, okay. So what I was going to show you was, um, well, first of all, you've seen the hoop. So that's, I'll, I'll just turn this onto my other camera. So if you just bear with me a second. Okay. So let me just, right, okay. So these are the hoops. So these are 10 inch or 25 centimeter hoops. So this particular one has been wrapped round and round like a spider's web, if you like, which will give you a base that you can stick something onto. Um, if I show you a finished one or an example, I'm just trying to get my screen to go a little bit larger and it doesn't seem to want to do that. Um, right, okay, yeah. So perhaps you can see that more clearly. So that is a seahorse which has been produced using uh, felt actually in this instance this is a fused fabric seahorse and what I've done is I've wrapped the edge using fabrics and using embroidery thread and then I've used some wire um no wire some um um rope sorry plastic rope which I've got from B and Q and I've shredded up and then I've used some more funky foam to create these starfish and I've used some heat treated, this in this instance is some organza to create this effect of seaweed. And this is a larger one. Is it fishing wire that you've used? Um, 
no this this wire this this here this one yeah no it's from being q it's it, it's nylon rope so it comes in different colors it comes in red yellow green blue oh, right. and you've got to unravel it because it's very very thick initially but if you unravel it um and then it, for this i've actually used a cigarette lighter and i've burnt it at the end which i know is a health and safety no no in school um but it makes quite a nice little kind of blob at the end um and they can create quite interesting it's kind of uh, seaweed type forms um and then this is another one which is a, a larger one I and mean, i don't know what the color's like for you it, i think you're probably seeing it with a color not quite as bright as it should be but this one was done using the plastic technique but you can see here how i've used a lot of foam if you look at the back you can see it's just just completely plain but then if you turn that over you can see that i've used a pen to actually push some holes into the surface um, and then I've actually added some paint as well onto here and used some little split pins. Uh, also on there there's a starfish which has been done using felt and that's been stitched through to create these little dots on it uh, and I, I use these shapes quite often as well so these again are cut from foam and then this is blue foam which has just had some white um, uh, paint on it to create a bit of contrast. So, you know, as I say, if you've not used it before, it is very useful. And then somebody's, this, somebody's asking where you get the hoops from. Um, well, you should be able to get them from Hobbycraft. There is um, somewhere down south, there's a garden centre called Martin Dark. And you can bulk buy. So I ridiculously bought 400 hoops um, mm -hmm. for about £120. I think if you, if you buy over a certain number, you don't pay for poachers in packing. So if you know you need a lot, then that's um, a good place to go. So it's Michael Dark with an E, I think. If you put Michael Dark Garden Centre, that, that should come up. So other ideas for decorating these hoops include wrapping them. So I've got various examples in, in different stages here. So you can wrap them. This one's wrapped with fabric and, and wool, uh, some fabric on that one. Um, and as I say, on this one, I've got some chiffon and organza, which actually creates a kind of a, a nice effect where you're coming away you're coming out from the circle into the surrounding area and um, this is one based on peacock this is the plastics one so this one has got all of the chiffon to create this this border and then it's been wrapped at the back you can see so that's got the kind of spider's web technique and then here i've got the the the, uh, the feathers here with the sequins in the in the middle there so that's, that's another idea um but yeah and what's nice is they're very light as well so and they're very you know pretty sturdy so you can use them for um for your display purposes so i've just got one or two other um items which i've done using that technique and it's it's just quite interesting for you to perhaps see see those so there's there's the front if i hold it still sometimes hard to get it to focus there we go okay so there's the frog so that's from a drawing that i did so there is the original that's a photocopy from the original drawing so i've put the plastic on traced around it then made the sandwich with the cellophane and the tracing and this one is perhaps a more interesting one to see which is part way finished you can see on this one so there's a sandwich idea with the the plain piece at the bottom then these elements that are actually placed inside and then the top where the, there's the tracing with sharpie this best thing then you go all the way around all of the edges and then you can start to stitch in between the shapes that you've drawn and in this instance i've used some gold paper and because of the way the stitching works if you go round the same shape a few times, it actually makes the middle bit kind of pop up a bit. So it's it's quite textured, this one. So you've got these raised areas. But I also have other templates. So these are quite uh, interesting to see it's kind of part way done things. So we just hold it still. So you can see here the butterfly. And what I've done is started outlining it first. And then you take some pale, I start with pale colours. So do pale colours to darker colours to your darkest colour and again blending all those together and then machine stitch around the edges again 
when all of that filling in has been done. So there are all sorts of different templates at various uh, stages of completion. You can add other things to it as well. So you can add things like um, sequins on. So that's one which I did as a demo for a, a Zoom for school uh, last week, actually. Um, so this one you can see, you can add the fin as a separate piece. Uh, this one, it's got little sequins stitched around it. You can hand stitch it. Uh, it's very, very versatile. So uh, there are also some uh, that I wanted to show you as well, which I'm working on at the moment. And I was going to just show you um, an idea. So I don't know if you've heard of um, somebody called William de Morgan, who was, um, he used to, he produced tiles, a kind of contemporary of William Morris, or perhaps slightly later. Um, but he produced lusterware tiles and platters. And I'm doing a piece of work based on his work. And so I've, I've started to do some drawings based on his fish and uh, different creatures, actually. So I've got some fish, um, some fish here, one here. Um, it's, it's quite a nice technique to use if you have some students maybe who aren't so confident with drawing. I always do my own drawings and work from those. But if you had a student who wasn't keen on drawing, you could actually print something out from the internet and then they could work onto onto that because they're going to be transforming it anyway and making it their own their own thing but if i just go back to to uh this one here so the the pieces are all made with lusterware which is um a very very shiny almost iridescent glazes so this one this this fish is is based on this piece here so what I've done for this one, it, it's not it's not very stitched at all. What I've done is taken the plain piece, then taken a piece of, of this fabric, this cellophane, which is, as you can see, is almost see-through, put that in the middle of the sandwich and then put the traced one on the top. Then all I've done is stitched around the black lines. And then I've also started to add in some Sharpie to create some detail on that. And there's another one here, which is finished. That one, that one had gold paper behind it. And there's another one here. And again, that one's got gold paper and that's got acrylic on it. So the idea is that these are going to be swimming around the outline, swimming around a circle, um, which kind of represents a, a plate, if you like. So I'll, I'll just show you how to, to layer these up so that you, you're clear how to go about it. So what I've got here, um, I've got a, a clear piece of cellophane, just move this out of the way, a clear piece of cellophane and what I'm going to do if I just put that down and I've actually traced the fish, so the fish I showed you first of all I think, uh, trace that, there's the, there's the drawing, so I've done the tracing from that, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, to put that down on the table and I'm going to put a clear piece of cellophane on the top. Now you'll notice that I've traced the, the fins and this larger fin here separately because they're going to be stitched separately and put on as separate pieces. OK, so then what I've got here are some pieces of silver paper. So, so yeah, so template down first, then a plain piece on the top. And then what I'm doing is I've got silver paper from Chinatown in Manchester and I'm just going to lay that down over the fish so you're making it a sandwich I'm going to cover over most of it here piece there uh, I use this paper quite often so if you are anywhere near Manchester there's a Chinese kind of art and craft shop which sells this paper and it's it comes in gold as well and it's very useful if you wanted to do something with a shimmer as I said, you can put fabrics in here as well. I mean, I, I could add a bit of a bit of chiffon in there, so I could put some of that in. Um, so you just layer it on, and then on top of that, I'm going to put some of this cellophane because that changes the uh, appearance of it quite dramatically. So you can see it's a kind of a, a pinky colour almost. I'll just lay that on the top that a little bit more on here 
and then when you feel you've got enough and you don't need to spend ages doing this quite often students spend their ages placing it really carefully but there's actually no need to do that and then you just pull your template from underneath and then you position the template on the top and at this point if you think things are in the wrong place you can just kind of shift them around a bit to get them where you want them to be and you can move that up to there and then you just simply pin them together so again a mistake that students make is they, they think oh, i'll just pin it around the edges that could be fine it'll all held together but you've got to put quite a lot of pins on to make sure you're going through the majority of the papers so i do have some pins here somewhere um, and then the stage after that is to to actually free machine stitch just around the edges or, or rather all over the uh, the lines that you've placed down so just pinning it down quite often what i do when i do the these other ones if i just just revert back quickly to one i've someone shown you earlier on so that that's a plastic seahorse so I quite often use these safety eyes. So those are from Amazon. Um, you should be able to buy packs of safety eyes from China, obviously. Um, but you should be able to get a, a pack with literally, you know, dozens and dozens of them in for, for under £10. So it's much cheaper to buy them in bulk than just go and buy a pair of eyes. But what I always do is get, get some funky foam. So this is a funky foam and then put the eye through one piece of funky foam and then cut around it so you leave a little border and then put it through another colour and then put a border again. So it just it just highlights the eyes and brings them, you know, uh, as, a, as a focal point. Although on the ones I'm doing at the moment, these which are based on the um, William de Morgan pieces, I'm not doing that. I'm actually leaving the eyes um, as stitched because the idea is I want it to look like a piece of ceramic. So I don't want anything um, getting in the way of that. So again, just pin all these down with the pins. And you sew through the funky foam, somebody Yes, like yeah, very easy. It's very, it's very, very soft. So if you, um, I'll show you this, it's very, it's very flexible, very easy to cut. Uh, scissors somewhere. Yeah, so it's very easy to cut. Um, and as I said, you can incise it so you can take a pen or a pencil or a biro and you can then, you, you just press into it. I mean, in this instance, the biro isn't actually working, but that doesn't matter. Um, I, I, I've got some scissors which have got serrated edges and so you can actually cut leaves out which are shaped. So that, I'm going to just keep my hand still. Okay, you can see that. And then what you can do is put some, um, put a bit of paint on your finger maybe. And if you use dryish paint, then it'll drag across and it won't go into those little ridges that are indented there. Um, also, as I said, you can use biro on there. You can use um, uh, ac acrylic um, and you know, paint the edges as well. And as I said, when you're sticking these down, if you put them onto something, you would stick them so that they, stand up so that you're not you're not sticking flat down you're trying to make something look quite organic um as a, as a finished thing uh, you get it in different colors as well i think you can get it in, in patterns you can get it in animal print a good place i've found to get it from um is the range if you look on their website and and look at uh, it's a crayola range they have and it's very much cheaper if you buy it in single sheets from places like hobbycraft it's about 50 pence a sheet which is ridiculous you can from the the range get um probably about 50 pieces for about five pounds at least that was what they were the last time i i looked so it, it is worth shopping around for things like that oh the safety eyes obviously um keep my hands still there's the safety eyes and they come with a little backing on so when you put the backing on obviously these are these are for soft toy making so when you put the backing on which I won't do now, but that'll that will stay on because it'll go across a ridge and it, that should stay firmly attached. Um, okay, so that's all pinned down as, as far as it I need to go now. I think just put another one or two in. I should have to put a needle in because I've got 
not close enough pins. Um, has anyone got any more questions at the moment, or is everybody okay? Okay, so as I say, you, you can hand stitch on these as well. Um, so if you if you're perhaps in a department that doesn't have as many uh, sewing machines, and I've been in those sorts of departments, some of them have got uh, five sewing machines. One school I went to had it's a private school and it had eleven sewing machines, one for each student. So if you know, it just depends on how your resources are. But what you can do is have some students free machine stitching, but others can actually do some hand stitching as well. So you've got that option of hand embellishments as well. And also, as I said earlier, adding um, adding sequins as well. So that's an example where just the outline's been stitched. So if I just move these out of the way, and I've probably got just a, a few minutes just to show you how to make a start on this. So I'll just clear the decks. I assure you it is not as tidy as it seems to be in here. Um, so that, that's the wing that I'll do separately. So what you need to do first of all is you sewing machine. So let me just see if I can get this focus. It's sometimes a bit difficult. That's it. Um, so what you need to do, you need to have a dark colour on the top of the machine and a dark colour on the bobbin because you want the, the line to be really quite, quite solid. I don't often use black because um, black can sometimes be a bit too harsh. So if you if you use a dark blue, I find that that's normally um, it's, it's perfectly fine. So it's it's really good practice for uh, free machine stitching, actually. Of course, it's playing up because I wanted to show you. So I think it's probably going to start playing up. Oh yes, look at that. That's great, isn't it? Okay, that's not good. Okay. You might set it up before I started, inevitably. When you want it to go perfectly, it doesn't. Um, so you, if you're wanting to fill in with some other colours later, you start with the darker colour first, and then you add the lighter colours and then go darker and darker until you've finished. And then, as I say, you would stitch around your outline again. So that, that made a horrible noise. Probably not wanting to come through now. No, it's playing up. Never mind. What I'll do is I'll show you this particular one as a finished piece. I'm sorry, that's that's playing up, which is typical, isn't it? Um, so what you can see though is if I show you how it's gone in stages. So it's gone, gone from that. Then it's gone to that. Notice on this one, it's got kind of whiskers on it here. Can you see these? So this one, it's nearly finished, but not quite. So that has gone to that. So you can see when you've actually stitched on the plastic, it's, it's really strong. So you can cut out some quite fine pieces. And you can see that I've added some shading onto here. So there's, there's actually a lot of areas that aren't stitched, but you can see you don't need to stitch behind the, the, um, the body on there, but you can see the, the fins and they, once they, they're added as an extra piece, they again, they add a little bit more life and a bit more movement to it. So, so do you cut, cut away all the excess plastic? Is that yes, the last that's right? Yeah, that's right. So you can see, that, so these are going to be going around this, edging as I say so um and I like all of these quite curvaceous shapes like that okay and there's going to be a central focus of uh, there's going to be a deer so it's a, it's very wide it's about um it's a meter wide the piece I'm working on at the moment so that's explained all of that uh, I'll just quickly show you the tulip one which I showed you earlier on uh, in, as, a, as a piece to show you that's one side. One technical question whilst you're doing that. What um, somebody's asking, Sarah's asking, what setting do you have the freehand machine stitch on? Um, it's just a straight stitch. Is that what you mean? Um, I'm not sure. Does that answer the question? It's just it's just a very ordinary um, straight stitch. I don't do anything fancy. You know, it's, it's just a straight stitch. <laughs> you could put on something like different, like. If, does that make sense? It's what, sorry, is the... 
you have like the foot on something different, like um the bit underneath the foot. Oh, sorry, um, I'm not a textile teacher, but yeah, I I think you've got to have you got to drop the feed dogs. Is that it? I, yes, I, you do. Yeah, yeah. I haven't I haven't actually been trained on a sewing machine. I mean, I, I did something at school when I was probably about twelve, but as far as I know, if it works, it works. <laughs> So um, yes, but you've got to have the feed dogs drop so that then, then that gives you the, op the opportunity to really, oh, I know why it's not coming through because it's not threaded there either. Anyway, uh, yes, because that means you can move this around. So you can, you can imagine if you work on a piece of this size, you know, I, I find hoops quite restricted. So this gives the option uh, because it's quite thick to just move it around um, quite freely um, and you can get all sorts of interesting effects. On this one, you can see the little the butterflies are separate there. Um, and also, and do, you, do, you, do you stitch the butterfly on afterwards? Yes, so that's yeah. just stitched on with the uh, just the body part there. And then you can see that that will curve around. Uh, it hasn't got lights on, well, it has got lights on, but they don't actually work, they've run out. Um, again, these from wonderful Amazon, uh, you either love it or loathe it, Amazon, I think, don't you? Uh, but the strings of lights uh, are like this. So, Somebody's asking, um, are they quite stiff and would they stand up, for example, would you be able to make sculptures from them? Yes, you can make sculptures. So, yeah. You can do. So you could do all sorts of interesting, um, you know, tower shapes, totem pole shapes, vase shapes. So, yeah, because when you stitch them, they, they do get quite, quite interesting, quite tactile. As I say, the lights don't work on this one, but if I just put the lights behind it, let it show. Yeah, well, a little bit. Yeah, you're not guessing quite as good at an impression, but they are that little extra bit of, of, of interest, really. Thank you so much, Nikki. It's been totally inspirational. It's been brilliant. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I think we've answered all the questions that have come into the chat box. So don't, we, we, we have actually run out of time, but if anybody has yes. got any quick questions, um, shout up. <laughs> no just people saying thank you that was awesome <laughs> okay <laughs> okay well oh, somebody's to... asking where the cellophane has come from i think they've asked that a couple oh yeah of times. okay the cellophane again that was from amazon if you if you um google um iridescent cellophane the stuff i've used it comes i think it's about 14 15 pounds it's gone up a little bit now but it, and it might be Dale around but it comes in a pack of three and there's a very dark blue which is this one that you can see on here which is the blue and then there's one that I would describe more as an opal colour and then there's the one that I've shown you in this which is um, a, bit, a little bit more clear. Um, so basically Amazon. Amazon yeah um, also you can use quality street wrappers and things like that so any, any cellophane anything see-through um, I quite, as I say, I quite like using the organzas and things like that. And the other thing I bought from Amazon again, um, it was some, some florist cellophane with dots on. Um, and again, you can sandwich that between. I mean, you can even sandwich crisp wrappers. I mean, you know, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Anything that you can stitch through, and you know, if you wanted to kind of hit the upcycling um, aspects as well, then you can do that. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So, um, uh, I've uh, somebody's already asked, and you've already said that you do do workshops in schools. You also do a Zoom, yeah, Zoom workshop yeah. for for classes. Yeah, I'm um, based in um, in South Manchester. I live in Poynton near Macclesfield in Cheshire, so I do do Zooms to more distant places. Or I do, and we, are, and we are looking at organising you to come and do a workshop for us up at the Genome Centre next year. So look out for that. So um, your website, you've got a website. Yes, I have. Just if you just Google me, the website isn't particularly up to date. But if you look at Nikki Palmenter Artworks on Facebook, there are quite a few um, uh, posts from schools that I've done on there. So I always post um, after the workshop to, to promote them. So you can see the sorts of things that people have been doing with me at, at school workshops. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much, Nikki. That was brilliant. And everybody's just saying, wow, loved it, fantastic. So oh, thank you excellent. so much. Right, well, I can't see you all. I can't see <laughs> you. <laughs> so thanks, thanks, and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope there's been some useful information for you there. No, I think it absolutely has. Thank you so okay. much. You're welcome. Okay. Can I just ask another question? Yeah, go yes. on quick. Who's this? Yeah, sorry. Well, it was to do just a bit of confusion. You're talking about layering up plastics, and then you're talking yeah. about cellophane. 
So the plastic yes. that you drew on, is that yeah. more like the sort of that you might use for cheap shower curtains? That yeah, exactly. Plastic? Yeah, because that's right. not stuff okay. by using shower curtain. Yeah, so those are the, those, yeah. the, those are the bread and the cellophane the the filling. Yeah, that's what I thought. But then with other questions, I began to just get a bit confused. Right, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks, Johnson. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, it will be going up on YouTube as soon as I get my act together, which will be in the next few days. So hopefully it'll be up very, very shortly. So thank you, everybody, for coming and uh, for joining us. And to th a big thank you to Nikki. Welcome. OK. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Do you want me to just log off, Dawn, now? Yes. Shall I just close it? Yeah, hold on just a tick. Let All right. Me... OK. I'll let you, I'll let you log out.